Hi, welcome to Election Security Part 2, The Infrastructure Strikes Back. My name is Amelie Coran. I will be your uh, panel moderator for this uh, session here. Little did we suspect that this set of panelists would be back together six months later to discuss where we are versus where we were when it came to election security and the upcoming November general election. Since then, to say it lightly, things have gone off the rails, given that uh, you now see us via video in our pandemic past. We've had a highly contentious Democratic primary season, some technical glitches supporting such primaries, court cases in regarding in-person voting, and enough various disinformation campaigns to last another election. One thing that hasn't changed is the lineup of our esteemed panel from ShmooCon. And tonight we have Kimber Dowsett, Casey John Ellis, Jack Cable, and Todd Beardsley. I will then let them introduce themselves with a short intro. Hey, I'm Kimber. I am the Director of Security Engineering at Trust. That's Trust.Works, a software infrastructure company based out of San Francisco that um, works with both the public and private sectors. Hi, my name is Casey Ellis. I'm the, uh, the founder, chairman, and CTO of Bug Crowd. Uh, we run CrowdSource Security as a service programs, including Vol Disclosure, Bug Bounties, CrowdSource Pen Tests, and so on. Um, and yeah, great to be unusual to be talking about this with all the additional content, but very good to be talking about it again. Hi everyone, my name is Jack Cable. I am an election security technical advisor for the US Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is essentially the nation's risk advisor. So we advise states and localities on the risks associated with different technologies, provide cybersecurity assessment services so that they can make the best decisions to have a safe and secure election. Um, besides my work at CISA, I am a student at Stanford and a security researcher. Cool, and hi, I'm Todd Beardsley. I'm a director of research at Rapid7, a US-based cybersecurity company. Um, I personally care a lot about elections. Uh, I am usually an election judge in, in Texas, and uh, I have a, a deep background in hacking, offensive security, research, vulnerability analysis, stuff like that. Um, and congrats to Jack for the uh, for the for the level up since our last meeting. He gets a bunch of power up points on that one. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we're going to break this down into two sections. Uh, I believe, on, unlike last time, but mainly kind of a catch up, uh, a first section here about what has happened since February. So we have a couple of questions regarding that, and then obviously a, a section B. We were we're coming up on uh, about ninety days till the general election. And uh, you know what we can do between now and then, since the timeline is definitely shorter. But also, uh, what kind of uh, activities are going to be uh, carried forward from them to the next election, the next primaries, or just in general lessons kind of learned. So with that, we have ourselves a first question here. Um, so we find ourselves here again after six months, and there's been a lot going on that we didn't cover back in February. However, regarding one of the last takeaways from closing that panel, we noted it was important to engage your local board of elections. And with that, where do we stand? Wow. Um, well, let me, let me start this off. Um, I engage with my local board of elections by being an election judge. I, I ran a polling place uh, not too long ago about uh, we're recording this on uh, end of July, uh, so from for me in this in this time stream, uh, this is about three weeks ago. There was a, a, a special election and a, and a runoff election combined uh, here in Texas. Um, it was pretty fun. Uh, there's there I never knew that like wiping down voting, you know, polling places would be so rewarding. Uh, I got to feel like I was battling COVID like every five minutes. Um, you know, helping people out, helping people vote. And so like, and, and for that, um, at least for me, like, I felt like I was really, I was, I was, I was doing something. Um, I did notice uh, through training and then on, on election day, um, you, you know, the demographics have swift, swift, switched over quite a bit on, on who is working in the polls. Like it is very common normally to see a lot of retirees and just you know older people who are who are there to help out and help out their communities um in in, in this way uh i was i was not the youngest person at this polling place which was first for me um so so if you have the opportunity and the inclination uh and don't mind doing a whole lot of cleaning all day long uh you know maybe volunteer to uh to to work in a polling place uh, come november anybody else yeah i mean 
what has happened since then, I think, you know, in, in terms of, of, uh, rocking up and helping out, it's, it's fair to say that, um, any intention to do that would have been a little distracted by, uh, you know, March and, and, and so on. But I think, you know, Todd's example of, of just doing what's needed, especially <clears throat> with, uh, with the pandemic and, and, you know, the changes in operational considerations around actually running an election still true. It's even more true now, I think than it was, um, as the uh, the token non citizen on on the uh, on the talk, I mean, this is even more foreign interference now than it was <laughs> uh, when we gave the talk Literally. at DC because I'm actually in Sydney at the moment. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, part of what we've we've been working on, what I've been working on, and a bunch of other people have been working on, is is um, you know, standardization of like how do we make adoption of vulnerability disclosure programs and and the implementation of policies specifically for 2020 with all of the you know, unique considerations this year has, um, how do we make those easy as possible for the states and counties? Um, so we updated a, uh, a version of the, uh, the language on disclose.io, which is an open source initiative to basically make it easy and make it uh, as standardized as possible. Uh, that came out after the talk and it's been good. I, I think, you know, at the, at the very least, that's actually served to get a lot more people thinking about doing that. Um, that, that maybe weren't before because that kind of blocking function of how do I even engage with the hacker community in the first place was, I think, pretty difficult for a lot of people to even consider. Certainly to echo um, yeah, Casey's point there, I think, yeah, something I've been involved with and, and pushing for um, is states and vendors to establish these vulnerability disclosure policies. Um, on the CISA side, we are releasing guidance to um, election officials in order to establish vulnerability disclosure policies, essentially saying, if you want to do this, this is the best practices that you can follow. Um, a lot of that is drawn from CISA's directive, um, it's the Binding Operational Directive 2001, which is a draft directive that will require all federal agencies to start a vulnerability disclosure policy. Yeah, that so was a, a big deal, by the way. So. Huge. Yeah, I think, yeah, really looking forward to see that come out and see the positive security effects that can have all across the federal government. Um, but of course, CISA doesn't have that same authority over states. Um, so we're essentially putting out guidance, um, giving them the best practices and the resources they need to start this themselves if they want that. Um, and then, of course, yeah, besides that, just um, the own work I've been doing, um, yeah, I've Clearly, yeah, not at the local level, but the federal level. And I think that there's really a lot of ability there to kind of have an impact at scale of working with all 50 states, working with a significant portion of the localities of the counties that are out there. Um, so I think that's yeah, a really great opportunity to be at CISA and have this kind of wide ranging effort, um, wide ranging effects that I'm not sure you can have anywhere else with election security. And Kimber? Yeah, I'll jump in. I, uh, it works out well since Jack touched on Casey's point. I'm going to touch on Todd's point. Um, was the prompt was, you know, what what's happened since February, and the answer is a pandemic. So, um, the reality oh, yes. of a lot, <laughs> the reality of a lot of the election security things that that we would normally talk about and that we will touch on today, still rely on people being able to actually get to the polls to yep. vote in states that aren't going to allow mail-in ballots. So um, I, I think it'll be a nice segue into uh, a lot of the misinformation we're hearing about mail-in ballots. But to Todd's point, um, we can scream to the skies that mail-in ballots are, are perfectly safe and reasonable and actually um, help disenfranchised voters have a voice. But there are going to be some places that insist on, that folks go to the polls and somebody's got to be there to man the polls or we're going to end up in a different um, a different type of disenfranchisement right where people are lined up for 20 hours because there's three poll workers you know for thousands of people who want to vote so um, it's important to know what's going on in your voting district and if your voting district allows mail-in voting uh, great, cool. But if they don't, like that's a perfect opportunity to get involved. And I understand that it's um, asking you to put yourself at risk too. And that sucks, right? It but, is. Yeah. Uh, that's where we're at. I am shocked. I did, 
I had a COVID test um, about four days after election day, and I am shocked I did not come up positive. But hey, you know, turns out masks and hand cleaning and surface cleaning works. So, yeah, you know, kind of the follow up on this too is, I mean, obviously the uh, curveball that we're thrown was the the pandemic, and yeah. you know, as Todd uh, Todd mentioned that you know primarily a lot of the election workers you know that were counted on by by uh, various precincts and states in general were were retirees and and those who. Uh, you know, I hate to say it, but have more time in their hands. Um, you know, this this is obviously going to be, be proving a challenge for staffing, and it runs headlong into the issues. You know, obviously some of the disinformation that's been spread about mail-in voting. You know, are there any particular ways that we can kind of uh, mitigate or address any of these issues um, that are novel? Obviously, we're running you know headlong against uh, you know people pushing back on the mail-ins, but then we have the reality of um, you know folks potentially exposing them to a deadly virus. Um, I, I hate to run the, the gambit of talking about like e-voting, but obviously there are other ways to, um, you know, look at, you know, potentially extending uh, voting times, alternating um, uh, places where people can vote to reduce uh, exposure. Are there any other, uh, you know, methods that, you know, potentially the uh, EAC and others can uh, address in this case? In before blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't throwing that out. You have to drink now. So. I mean, e-voting is a is a non-starter, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're recording this and it is today, uh, 97 days, by the time this airs, it'll be about 90 days before the election. Um, and you know, West Virginia is doing their thing and good, good for them. Um, but, <laughs> uh, no one else is, uh, I don't see anybody having any plans for that right now. Um, you know, maybe someday in the future, uh, you know, e-voting will be a thing, but uh, I don't, I don't, I think the, the easiest way to, to get people to the polls um, in states that don't have mail-in ballots is extending, uh, you know, early voting. I mean, that's a thing. Uh, Texas, I, I'm in Texas right now, so hooray, Texas. Um, we're bad at mail-in ballots, uh, but we're apparently really good at early voting. Our, my voting day, my first day to vote in November will be October 13th. Um, so that's a stupendous amount of time. Um, way longer. And so that'll be, that will help at least um, give people an opportunity to get into a polling place when maybe it's not so crowded. Uh, last day of early voting is super crowded and election day will be super crowded. So, if, you know, if you can vote um, in that early voting period, I strongly suggest you do uh, that. Uh, you know, it doesn't help any of the IT problems that we talk about um, and that nominally this panel is supposed to be about, <laughs> um, but it does help the like not getting COVID. So, which, you know, might be a little more important. Amber? I want a, a plus one to the adding more polling places because we know social distancing is huge to prevent the spread of COVID. Yeah. Um, when we have communities like mine where there's one polling place downtown and then one local school, um, then we have basically the town split in half to go to these two polling places and it gets kind of crazy. Um, holding people to districts, we see some gerrymandering, right? They'll draw a, a line right through the middle of the university so that half the university students think that they're supposed to vote at one place and it's really the other. So, you know, if they're going to say no mail-in ballots, then why not say, but all the schools in a single district can vote. And if you're eligible to vote in one, you can vote in any of them so that folks can at least get to the closest, you know, place. And we do our best to like disperse the population. But a lot of towns have a couple polling places. They're almost always schools, which who knows if schools will even be open. Um, but if they are, you sure don't want to have a hundred thousand people rolling through a school that children are going to be at the <laughs> next day, right? Like, so there's, there's physical considerations that certainly were not part of our equation in, in what, February 1st, when we <laughs> jammed through all the things we think could go wrong. This was not on my bingo card. So. No, <laughs> yeah. no, no. So the thing that's to me, that's, that's new uh, is, is and, and I've actually, I've heard, Todd say this in, in a panel on this before, um, you yeah, know, democracy does rely on, on the peaceful concession of whoever loses. Um, so the, the increased likelihood of, of a hanging um, count 
because of mail-in voting and the changes in the process and different things like that. I, I think there was a lot of conversation back in, in January and prior around the role of risk limiting audits uh, to, to basically, you know, say, no, this is not like any, any accusation of fraud can be basically the confirmed or denied at that point. Um, projects, you know, to, to give a shout out to is, is Arlo, um, uh, A-R-L-O, which is essentially a framework for that that I believe is funded by CISA uh, and, and is open source. Um, and something that I've been trying to encourage uh, people in the security research community to do is to go bang on that, actually go look at it from a security standpoint, because ideally if there's any point in time over the next six months where Arlo itself gets called into question as, as, a, as a tool to, to rebuff, um, at least at that point, we can say, no, we actually you know, went through this and it, and it seems legit. So that, that to me is new. Like that was always going to be some, to some degree of risk as it always is. Um, but I think that's actually a, a far, that's going to play a far greater role um, actually post-election, on election day and post-election day in, in 2020. Yeah, I think they, they covered a little bit of that on the, the HBO special with Hari. Um, as well as, you know, I think it was just yeah. the second half of the, the documentary was regarding the risk limiting audits. I don't know if they necessarily had a, a really good explanation of how it all worked. Um, that, that is a little extra math for most folks, but, um, you know, it's one of those good things that can be put in. I think, and looking at, looking at, um, so, you know, calling myself out, this, is, this was a theme, and the last time we got together as well, uh, acronym, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the acronyming stuff. So risk limiting audit is what RLA stands for. Uh, I think it's verified voting uh, who, who are running point on it. And they've done some pretty, I think, good work on explainer videos that take some, you know, fairly complicated math and, and kind of simplify the concept to the point where a non-technical potential voter can actually consume it and understand what's going on. It's essentially, a, a, you know, a cryptographically, determined sample random sample set um, that's then paired with verification of of the outcome uh, compared to what's recorded and if there's any sort of deviation or margin of error within that sample set then it goes again and goes again and goes again until it can work out the scope of that um, <clears throat> or you know if everything checks out then everything checks out and, and things are okay at that point but it's the randomization and the process around it that I think is to your point, difficult to explain on a technical level to most people, but I think the concept itself is actually fairly easy to, to grok. Yeah. Great, and just to kind of yeah, go back a little to our discussion on the different kinds of voting options that there are, it's clear that the election is going to be run a little differently this year, um, just with the constraints we face. Election officials have to provide an accessible and safe method of voting for their voters. And what this means is essentially from CIS's perspective, we want to limit the risk as much as possible with these options. So for instance, talking about online voting, um, also called electronic ballot returns, CISA has assessed that that is high risk, even with controls in place, the risk there still cannot be controlled. And it's not CISA's job to decide whether these are deployed, but it's our belief that the risk on these is much higher than say compared um, to in-person voting or mail-in ballots. Um, so on that end, CISA has put out a series of documents essentially um, describing from a procedural sense um, what kinds of options election officials have, both to ensure safe in-person vote voting and then also to make sure that mail-in balloting process goes smoothly. And um, just to touch on some of the in-person voting options there, um, it is very true, of course, that like Todd was saying, that the truth is a lot of these poll workers are older and they face a higher risk of being impacted by the virus. So there's going to be very high poll worker shortages. And a lot of cases that means consolidation of polling places because they can't staff that many. And that of course can lead to problems because then you have more people in fewer places with a pandemic that's of course not ideal. Um, but we have to make it work. Um, so one option there is um, vote centers, for instance, where um, larger physical polling places that make it easier to maintain physical distance. Um, there's, of course, still a polling shortage. Um, I guess here I'll say to everyone who is young and healthy, the best thing you can do is serve as a poll worker and make sure that um, on a local level, your elections run smoothly. 
But um, yes, it is going to be a challenge just because, yeah, of course, in-person voting um, carries some risks with it from a health perspective. Um, so we encourage states to make the decisions that best fit them, but both mail-in balloting and in-person voting we view as being low-risk options given that there's a paper trail um, and you can run, say, risk limiting audits on those. Cool. So I'm going to take kind of a little bit of a left turn. I know, you know, we just full transparency for folks who are watching this, like we have a list of questions that we've agreed on, but I'm going to kind of <laughs> find this because of the way the flow is. Um, you know, one of the things is that's amazing about like where we live, we're in the United States here and, and Casey accepted, but yeah, we, we, we will adopt you on this one. Most of the time. Um, you know, is, is the, the freedom of speech, you know, it's part of the, our own constitution and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, as we mentioned in February, you know, one of the critical things about this election is how we talk about it, um, whether it be through uh, discourse about outcomes, uh, whether it be the primaries or the general election, uh, the methodologies we uh, use to do that. So we, you know, talk about in the press about like how things have gone, uh, the process of, of, you know, how we go about voting, but also, uh, you know, it's, it's another thing called disinformation or misinformation where, uh, you know, what we talk about is willingly bad, uh, essentially not right uh, when fact-checked um, or in, in some cases, uh, is disinformation provided by an external entity. I know, you know, with the 2016 and uh, earlier, or, uh, the recent, the, the, the midterms, uh, we had influence from outside sources. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, uh, Washington Post just recently kind of covered that we're, we're potentially seeing some, some influence from China and Iran and some of our other, uh, you know, we classically qualify them as adversaries, but yet we, we still find some ways to deal with them. You know, where do we kind of find ourselves in this this case right now? I, obviously, you know, six months later, uh, you know, we had a little bit of a, a kind of I wouldn't say necessarily contentious uh, Democratic primary, primary, but um, you know, uh, it was a lot more graceful when people, uh, you know, uh, basically, you know, said yeah, I'm out, uh, and let people carry forward. But also, uh, you know, in recent news about how people are are talking about. Um, uh, you know, the, the legitimacy of the methods that we're using. Where, where do you kind of see ourselves now and, and what, what can we do uh, in the future here, both as folks who are attendees uh, to this, uh, this video, but also, um, you know, as responsible citizens to kind of educate uh, others, your, your parents, your friends, your peers, your neighbors, and so forth to uh, be on the lookout for this. Um, I'll, I'll rush into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I think an interesting thing that I that I've seen is that yes, I, I when we did our panel back in early February, which seems like so long ago now, I think that we could pretty clearly say like Russia, <laughs> like mm -hmm. we're seeing the Twitter bots, um, the farms, we're seeing like the disinformation campaigns on Facebook, Twitter, IG. Um, now I, I, it's, it's much more complicated. Um, so the interesting thing that we've seen now are, well, well I feel like it's interesting cause I'm a, you know, social media nerd, the QAnon accounts that have popped up seem to span the gamut of countries. I, um, yeah. And you see a lot of activity from these QAnon accounts just coming from the U S and they're not like some, you know, complex, uh, combative nation state, right? They're from just like diehard MAGA people who have are like, I'm going to do my duty and this is patriotic and they are figuring out how to spin up bots. And so that's pretty interesting. And then to see um, bots that will respond to Trump accounts, right? Or the interesting thing that I see a lot too are accounts that get a lot of followers because they'll post pornography, right? And then they get like loads of followers and then they get verified in some cases. And then as soon as they get the check mark, they switch to like QAnon accounts that have give themselves some name that you can recognize in the media. And all of a sudden you think you're engaging with someone that you're not engaging with. But what that does is have this like celebrity or verified um, boost of this misinformation. So uh, for me, as a person who has a blue check mark, I wanna say, <laughs> 
I don't know anything. I'm not an expert on any fucking thing. And I'm going to tell you <laughs> flat out that like, you'd be hard pressed to find a blue check mark that is an expert on everything. So if someone gets their blue check mark for being an actress, like maybe don't just immediately trust that they're an expert on vaccination protocol. Right. <laughs> so I think that um, it's, it's really fascinating how the floods are coming and the stuff that Cambridge Analytica did. It's, it's all still happening um, under a different name, a, a different company, yeah. but it's all still out there on Facebook and Twitter. It's just like now more people from different countries, including our own are able to participate in the, in the disinformation process. Yeah, I'll I'll tag in on that. Just just confirm what you, what you're saying, like the, the the QAnon stuff and and things of that nature. That they're, they're happening on the ground uh, here in in Australia. Um, I think for you know for ostensibly different reasons from a from a partisan political standpoint, but it's kind of coming from the same mindset. And I think in in part, like we're all going a bit stir crazy right now. It's it's good not to ignore the fact that. Um, society just in general is is dealing with mental stress that we've not seen collectively um for as long as twitter's been around definitely so weird shit happens um but yeah there's 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 that piece of it i think you can you touched on a really good point um, i actually got um invited to um talk about disinformation on a friend who has a cooking channel she's got like millions and millions of sus- subscribers but she saw uh basically bought like advertising focused bot generated content um, ripping off her stuff and then noticed that there was subversion starting to creep into that and then the, the ability for that type of channel to be used. Um, <laughs> That's so crazy. Well, it's nuts, man. Like it, it was, and I'm like, what am I doing on a cooking channel? This is crazy, but no, they it, have it, an entire channel yeah. on this, like uh, yeah. basically uh, debunking some of these, uh, these bots or the, 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 the content farms. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a real thing. And, and I think the ability for that sort of thing to be deployed very rapidly, because these are, these are businesses, it's, it's businesses that exploit the, the things that are exploitable to build following on social media in some of the ways that Kimber just described, but then they sell that or rent that, or if they're owned, you know, potentially by a, by, you know, an actor that can go hostile, it's mm-hmm. redeployed into that. And that's happening across all sorts of different channels. The one uh, you asked Amelie about, you know, things that we can do. Um, I think something that we can all agree on, uh, the, the great hack, for example, just as a, you know, a way to get people that aren't necessarily technical in a, in a context that's apolitical. So you're not sort of going one way or the other too much. You're just explaining to them this general idea that like social media is a constructed reality that's been built just for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and you actually need to be, observing it like that i think you know for the for the hackers that are kind of watching this that's probably a, a thesis and something that's important that we could all agree on and i found that to be fairly fairly helpful great and just to talk briefly on uh, foreign disinformation of course that's a very large concern we've seen in 2016 what happened and in 2020 it seems to be shaping up again we know yes our nation's adversaries russia Trump, china iran are all targeting trying to interfere in our democratic processes um, so from CIS's perspective, our number one priority is to ensure that Americans decide American elections. So that means ensuring that foreign adversaries are not able to interfere, um, whether that's um, by actually targeting election systems, whether that's disinformation campaigns, all of that. Um, it should be Americans who are deciding American elections. Um, so that kind of leads us to the point then what steps can Americans take to mitigate the impact, say, of disinformation um, or just general confusion, um, say, on election night? I think the most important thing here is just to understand that elections are going to be different this year. Election night, November 3rd, is not going to be the same as election night in the past because with many more mail-in ballots, they're going to take much longer to count just due to state laws and processes around that. Um, as well as just technical constraints, um, since some states are rapidly scaling out, scaling out mail-in ballots at a scale that is maybe tenfold from what they previously had operated. Um, so with that perspective, election night, it is entirely possible that it just isn't 
final, what the election results are. And it may take a week, it may take several weeks to actually learn what the final results are. So the best thing that Americans do is to just internalize this, understand that election results are not going to come out immediately. The media has a large role in this, that it can't just be election night, the final results to clear who won, because we have to acknowledge that might not be the case. Um, so I think that if we all are on the same page expecting um, this to be a slower process and keeping in mind that a slower process means that there's more time to actually verify that results are correct and to ensure that um, th the final count is ultimately the right one. Um, so I think just understanding that patience is needed here and that election night, not going to know who won, may take some time, but we'll get there and we can be confident then in the outcome of the election. That's the important thing. Yeah, and just to follow up on what Jack said, is like election night is not is is not the end of this, right? Like, um, for starters, like any kind of disinformation campaign that we've been talking about, uh, that's going to happen way before election day. Like I mentioned, I get to vote on October thirteenth, so uh, uh, you know, look for something exciting happening around I don't know first or second week of October. Um, almost like that's the time when your uh your 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 fear ganglia should flare up around what's going to be happening uh around around uh, disinformation and just the, and just one other super quick point um jack is also totally correct that um i i would be shocked if we had if we had results election night now it doesn't mean it's the end of democracy like there will not be rioting in the streets over this we've done this before like the 2000 some people on this call are old enough to remember the 2000 election <laughs> and uh and we remember that like that was weeks and weeks and weeks of of will they won't they uh, which ended up in the supreme court decision so like that did not destroy america and not having election results at you know 1 a.m on, on november 4th is not gonna is not gonna kill everybody like we'll be fine we'll be fine yeah, that does bring up a good point, you know, or, or subsequent question here, you know, it's kind of talking some of the logistical errors, um, you know, just to put on an election is not as easy as everybody kind of thinks. Like you just go in there and pull the handle if you're in manual or you- It is way more complicated. <laughs> it is way more complicated. I mean, I, you know, just uh, watching Matt Blaze's uh, Twitter feed sometimes and just how simplistic some of the suggestions are. And then, of course, Matt being Matt kind of fires back in Matt's way and, and, and whatnot. And that's not a knock on him. It's just to try to educate people that yeah. this, this shit ain't that's simple. So. Um, you know, as much as I, I, I railed on my trip to the DMV recently, you know, I sat in the car and kind of pondered you know, everything required to kind of make my trip better. And I'm just like, oh, my God, that's, that's a lot to move. That, that's Sisyphean in a way. Um, but, you know, obviously one of our, one of our bigger challenges, obviously the thing that made the, the biggest press right after our uh, February conclave here was uh, the Iowa caucus. Um, and I wrote a, a long paper on this about the whole DevOps process in regards to how it was developed. But, you know, we had the Iowa caucus with the Georgia primaries, which, you know, some would say was kind of a predictable outcome of, you know, what kind of a cluster fuck it would be. Um, but, um, you know, that's the other, the other issue is underscore the potential um, about how trust is eroded through procedural process error by no fault or intent of the creator of that error. It was more or less like we're, we're, we're forging new areas of uh, uh, election things we can do and, and mistakes will be made. Um, you know, there was no necessarily evidence when, when looked at that, uh, you know, interference necessarily occurred, but you know, when, when, you know, basically these things that we do in so nice a word, shit the bad, you know, what are the different ways that we can as professionals in the security and election security arena kind of capture the discussion and say, you know, this shouldn't erode trust. Uh, this is this us trying something new. Um, mistakes will be made. Um, uh, morale will be you know, lowered, but you know, what are, what are some things at the technical level to kind of, as I mentioned, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of technical people that will swoop in and say, oh, we can fix this with this blockchain for instances, as Casey <laughs> so lightly joked about, but um, you know, what are, what are some things, some, some practical techniques we can have to kind of educate some people on like, no, 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 this is, this is a, this is a big ship to steer. Um, you know, what, this, this is what you can expect and, you know, uh, don't lose trust in this. 
Great. So first, just to really underscore the point that running elections is incredibly hard. Um, there's so much more than just um, kind of from a voter's perspective, showing up to, um, say, a polling place, casting your ballot. There's so much more that goes into this process, so many months of preparation. That's a difficult task. And every single election official I've talked to is incredibly motivated and wants to make sure that elections run smoothly and that their people can, in a free and fair manner, decide um, who um, will win the election. Um, so just thinking about, um, like going back to February, say it was already shaping up to be perhaps one of the hardest elections that an election official has had to run just because we are in an incredibly polarized environment. We know that there is foreign interference that occurred in 2016 and we can expect again in 2020. So even from that perspective, this was a hard task. And then you add the pandemic and everything becomes so much more complicated because suddenly we can't vote entirely in the same way as we're used to voting. And all of these processes have to change. Um, in a lot of cases, like I said, election officials now have to scale out mail-in ballots at 10 times the capacity. And when your machines process those, we're only intended to do say a small percentage of voters in your jurisdiction. From a technical perspective, that can be very difficult and things can break because we're rapidly scaling out these technologies and things can and likely will go wrong. Um, so from that perspective, what should voters expect? Um, so I said before, be patient. Election results may not come in immediately and that's fine. I think the second point there is really to expect things to go wrong, but don't immediately believe that that is say a result of interference of any kind because the most likely explanation is that's just some routine error that occurred and that will be worked through. There's process in place um, in order to handle um, these types of failures. We have for the most part paper trails that allow verifying elections. Um, so from that perspective, we have controls in place and yes, technology can be brittle and stuff can break down but a lot of times just look for the most likely explanation that um, of course interference is still possible yeah. and we should be very concerned if and if that does happen but um, just looking from kind of what is most likely to happen um, it's more likely that I mean we can almost assume that some technical failure in some capacity will occur but that doesn't mean that's malicious and um, the people just have to view it as that way and understand that there are still controls in place. Yeah, Occam's razor is good. I can't remember if it's Hanlon's razor or Occam's razor, but it's one of the razors. I think it's Hanlon's. Um, Han yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, this, uh, well, simple ends, malice. Anyway, whatever. Is, uh, we, can, we can probably look that one up after the fact and I'm outing myself for not knowing which razor is which right now. Um, I'd add to that, no new stuff in 2020 like timeout uh you know it, like there's there's a whole bunch of innovation happening in 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 the election space which i think is fantastic and, and i think it's important it's going to be critical um after this is done um but you know sure. the addition of, of of variables you know the the idea that, that there's like software fails um which is gonna, the second point i'm going to make but like it's the failure rate of software is directly proportional to, to how quickly it's been brought to market and oftentimes how mature it is. Um, so this, this idea of like, cool, let's just blast 2020 with a whole bunch of brand new stuff that we haven't really tested. You know, ultimately when you go back to Iowa and, and do a bit of a root cause analysis, that's sort of most of what happened there. It was less um, than six weeks when I did the analysis. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and it's logically what would happen again if we do it with other stuff. So no new stuff, but then this other idea of like software, you know, in terms of, again, coming back to how we can help, like humans aren't, humans make mistakes, period. Like this is, this is why, you know, we've got an industry is because, you know, while we come up with all these incredible ways to, to do stuff, including democracy itself, um, we do make the occasional spelling error and then there's bad people that want to manipulate that to get what they want. So this idea of like to err is human, it's more about how you respond. Um, again, it's, it's part of what I like so much about you know, vulnerability disclosure uh, as a process, but also as this like leading indicator of maturity when it comes to security of an organization that can translate to trust. I think that's, that's a concept that um, isn't very well understood 
and I think a lot of the time people, you know, on the on the on the operations side would prefer to just do ostrich risk management and pretend it, it didn't exist. But I think it's going to become pretty important in context of all of the stuff that can and probably will go a bit funky uh, this year. Casey, you have some of the best vuln disclosure jargon around. <laughs> I, I love. I've, I've, uh, I've been I've been practicing. Yeah, a little. Um, yeah, like I guess I would just say as as technical people who are probably the only people watching this, um, you know, I think what you can you can do your part by uh, not freaking the hell out <laughs> when you see something that goes wrong, like. Um, you know, just to echo, you know, Jack, Jack and Casey, it's like, it is, it is a hand lens razor kind of thing. There will probably be mistakes. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I would go so far as to say, like, it's super, hard. I've got a Metasploit shirt on. It's very hard for me to say, like, don't disclose vulnerabilities. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> maybe not on election day. Um, and maybe not make a bunch of hay about like hackable voting machines. Like that is kind of the least of our worries. If all we had to worry about was a hackable voting machine, like that physical device, boy, that would imply that we've fixed so many other problems in, in infrastructure, in disinformation, in, in everything up and down the line. So, um, you know, I, I would hope that, uh, you know, the folks that work in the space, uh, who, who pay attention to things in, in voting village, um, you know, maybe not completely lose your cool over a, you know, a voting machine that can be hacked in person. So um, I'll do a quick response and I've, I'm sure Emily wants to move on, but this goes back to something that I said in February and it's a recurring theme because I feel like I say it a lot. So if you've heard it before, suck it because I'm going to say it again, <laughs> but the, the biggest disservice that we can do to the American people as security professionals is somehow convincing them that their votes don't count. And we do that by constantly preaching that the system's broken, the voting machines are hackable, the infrastructure's flawed, the voter registration system is you know something that can be tampered with. It's not to say these things aren't true, um, but also like you have to qualify those um, ramblings and, and announcements with how often that actually happens and what the likelihood of that happening actually is. And the, the idea that, you know, um, hacking 20 voting machines is gonna sway an election without even like acknowledging what it would take to actually hack the voting machine, right? Or to, um, to tamper with a voter registration system without acknowledging that like, you know, states do have some IDS systems in place. Like, sure, could it happen? Yeah, we can like, what if all day long? But if we're, if we're putting information out there that even makes one person think, well, my vote can just be changed anyway, so why would I bother voting? Like, then we've fucked up like bad because we've kind of, we like shot ourselves in the foot with the thing that we were trying to make better. So we're now into section B. So we've now pivoted from where we were six months ago to where we find ourselves in the last 90 days here. Uh, 90 days scares me because, you know, coming from the federal government, it takes longer than that mainly to fill out the paperwork for something. So 90 days for us in the real world, um, if in the commercial sector, it will be totally interesting. But Obviously, I'm going to highlight the fact that, you know, as Jack leveled up here, um, CISA has taken more of an active policy and assistance role for states. Uh, the Election Assistance uh, Commission Committee has uh, hired some really great new staff. In fact, some folks, who, uh, I believe, uh, Kimber and I were on the panel many years ago with. Um, and, um, you know, the feeling that uh, while it's awesome, they hired these people. Uh, and I know I've tweeted out about it. It's a little too late in certain cases, but, um, you know, they hire great people. What, what is the feeling right now that these folks can actually make a difference between now and the election? Or obviously if we can't do it by then, what, are the, what is the change that can be made uh, for further elections uh, provided that the world isn't gonna melt down? Yeah. Great, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, I can take this to start. Um, yeah, so it's true, yeah, CISA has brought on um, some more people to help out with election security. I'm part of a group of, um, me and four other Stanford students who all came to CISA to work specifically on election security. 
Um, and we've been um, having a lot of fun being able to um, work essentially on both the infrastructure component, building tools to allow organizations to better secure their systems and allow CISA to say, aid in assessments to state and local election officials, um, as well as working on some of that say foreign disinformation component. Um, so in terms of what um, both say CISA and EAC can do by November, I think there's a lot that can still be done. Of course, yes, we have, I believe, I calculated this, I think it's 89 days from the time the talk this is airing until the election. And that's very little time, um, almost nothing, but we still can do a lot. We can help, um, say, states identify vulnerabilities in their systems. We continue to offer services that assess these systems um, and give guidance. Uh, I mentioned before, we have documents that we published um, along with the Election Assistance Commission um, and we're working to support states in the capacity that we can. Um, so I think that there's a lot that um, still, of course, needs to be improved, but we're getting there. And from my perspective, yes, the government plays a large role in this, the federal government. And I really do think that um, states, this is, I'd say, one of the major improvements since 2016. 2016, the federal government's involvement with the states was not at all near where it was today. So much has improved since then that we are now working with every, each of the 50 states. We're working with a significant portion of the local election offices, and we're in a much better place both to be um, protecting systems and then monitoring in case stuff does go wrong. So, you know, you speak to obviously kind of the, the involvement um, with CISA and, um, you know, kind of the states uh, taking a more active role in their, their own survival in a way. Um, you know, have, have any of the, the vendors, uh, either of the e-poll books or the election systems been more willing to uh, kind of come forward and work proactively with the government or, you know, say any of the companies represented on here to kind of solve the problems. I know, you know, I, I've recently been involved with some uh, workshopping with OECD on regards to uh, vulnerability disclosure policies and, and digital product security. And one of those cases is, 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 is finding a good mediator sometimes to kind of do that. Um, you know, has, has anybody kind of moved that way or are we still kind of like, you know, kind of finger pointing and, and, and moving forward there? So in terms of CISA's involvement with this, um, of course, CISA's preference is for vulnerabilities to be disclosed either directly to the state or to vendors when that is possible. Um, and it is our view that, of course, vulnerability disclosure policies can be very helpful in this process. Um, I'm not aware of um, any vendors that at the time of recording um, or states for that matter that have come out with vulnerability disclosure policies um, that could very well change between the two weeks when this airs. Um, but what we do offer is resources for those that want to implement vulnerability disclosure policies to do so. So like I mentioned, we have our guide on vulnerability disclosure that will be live by um, the time this, um, this panel airs, um, as well as the fact that we do serve as a last resort for people who are unable to disclose vulnerabilities. Uh, for any reason, they can report it to US CERT, which is under CISA, and we will work to get that disclosed to the vendor um, in order to um, mitigate that vulnerability. So CISA does play an important role here. And um, yeah, it is our hope that, um, of course, yes, that any vulnerabilities that either people come to vendors with or come to us with, that they will be addressed. So, I mean, and just to follow up on that, I mean, we're getting we're getting under the wire, uh, at the wire, right? For for the November 2020 election. If if, if I were the king of vulnerable disclosure, <laughs> I, I think I would direct people to disclose to you personally, Jack, <laughs> um, and you know, by extension, this is a um, before vendors and states. Like, I mean, I think that's kind of the 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 way. Like, let's say I'm sitting on a vulner or I find a vulnerability in some election system or whatever. Like, and I'm a I'm a hacker guy. Who wears better split t-shirts? Um, <laughs> like I, I have it. I don't want to not tell anyone about it. You know, there is this like, it's okay to yell fire in a crowded theater if the theater is actually a fire business. Um, I think it's it's probably not great to like drop that on Twitter and just full disclose and do that. I mean, that's not helpful. I don't think in in 
in the slightest. Um, but I do think like, you tell me, like I, my, my instinct is, you know, tell SZA and hope for the best and keep my mouth shut until November, I don't know, 10th, 15th or something. Um, you know, so at least this is where they can do, I'm, I'm describing your job at you. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can do instrumentation, right? Like, so even if there's no fixes, there's still ways to, to, to track the, the vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, and you're exactly right there that yes, the priority is for the vulnerability to get fixed um, um, as quickly as possible. And we want to support whatever will make that happen um, as efficiently and smoothly. So of course it's ideal if it is possible to disclose directly to vendors, uh, but that is hard when there are no sure. disclosure policies. <laughs> Today, yeah, so in though. that case, <laughs> yes, exactly. Working, um, on, so, it. Working on it. <laughs> so given that, yeah, the current landscape, yes, CISA does serve as a coordinating role there uh, for people who, yeah, can't really find a contact to disclose. Um, they can come to CISA and CISA will work to make sure that the vendor or the state is made aware and that the vulnerability can be fixed. Yeah, I, I mean, hard, hard agree with, with Todd's suggestion of going to CISA, especially at this point, um, you know, keeping in mind as well that like with the 90 day kind of lead time that we've got, the vendors are very likely to be distracted um, and, and have lots of other things on their plate um, just from a pure logistical standpoint before you go layering on the pandemic and the fact that 2020 is generally a bit of a shit show. Um, you know, the, the thing that I, I, I wanted to double click on um, is actually around basically non-disclosure of findings ahead of, of, of November at this point. And this is very much opposed to, to how I, I normally talk about von disclosure. It's very hard to say. To run. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's a really, it's a really difficult thing to say. We actually talked about this in terms of the boilerplate um, election policy that we put up on disclose IO uh, and we've got it in there. It's like, you know, basically the agreement is not to disclose until after the election is finished. Um, ordinarily that, that timeline would serve as, as back pressure on the vendor to, to fix and I think that's a really good and an important thing for accountability and transparency but the risk of frightening a non-technical voter into just giving up and not showing up to the poll booths as as a product of trying to do something good I think is extremely high on this particular topic at this particular point in time so yeah um, it's a hard pill to swallow I think for security researchers in general it was definitely you know from where I from what we do and where I sit, it's a hard thing to say, but I actually do think it's the right thing for this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that's one of those, those things we we've kind of, you know, as I mentioned with some of the policy making, you know, obviously federal, international, whatnot, you know, we've, we've set the, I wouldn't say necessarily artificial 90 day deadline, but obviously if we're inside the 90 days, it does kind of create um, an unworkable framework with both in the timing, I think the regulatory environment for whatever folks need to do for certifications, plus, loading all the election information, the logistics of that. So, you know, it just creates this, this whirlwind of not a good situation for us to be in. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we talked about this, you know, earlier in regards to kind of the effect that COVID-19 uh, has had on how we staff the, the election, how we are attending the election and participating in it, obviously with retirees and whatnot. Um, there is so much dumpster fires being poured into the alley right now. It's not even funny. Um, and obviously with the disinformation and just all the stuff we talked about, if you were all betting people and if we were in Las Vegas this year, instead of doing this virtual, what would you bet to be the first thing to crumble out of all of this? What, what do you think is the first thing that is just like, you know, the, the guy from Oz comes out behind the sheet and says, yep, everybody go home. We're fucked. Um, if I was, a gambling person, which I'm not, um, I, I think it would be, if we're talking about the first thing to just go like shit house on fire, what do we do, is a bunch of maybe rebellious folks who would show up at polling places without masks and like fake cough and just make a big to do and just try to disrupt, you know, the peaceful line at the voting place. Right. Like I, I think that, sure. I think we'll see people tweeting, Oh, I got a mail-in ballot for my uncle who died last year. And then it gets 10,000 retweets and then somebody else 
tweet something similar. Like, I think we'll see that, but like just for shit house election day, like what are we going to see on the news? I think like polling places being disbanded for like civil unrest and not from the folks who are there just to vote peacefully. So this is starting to form like a John Carpenter movie in the worst way possible then. Well, I am a horror fan. So of course that's where I go. My hope is that people respect democracy regardless of which side of the line you fall on and just let people have their constitutional right to participate in the electoral process. However, I am currently disenchanted by the state of the country right now. So I don't know. I, I, I think that the your your first sign of, of everything going to hell is gonna be on like in the neighborhood of October thirteenth, October fourteenth. Um, that's gonna be where you have your your last big push of a disinformation of whatever disinformation campaign is is going on. I am not a disinfo expert by any means, um, but if I were going to own stuff, I would definitely want to tell people. But like the one of the tactics we've seen over and over again of of people who are attacking election systems is that it's no good unless you tell people about it, unless you get noticed. And so you got to get noticed like early enough to sway elections, but not so early that. You know, there's there's enough from you know that Jack can fix it for us. <laughs> um, so like October fifteenth, I think is the sweet spot for that. What is that? That's like Wednesday, I think, or Thursday. Um, non Friday, non Monday, early October. Uh, I would expect to see. I was expect to see big news to try to have that last push of, of hey guys, don't bother voting. And you think that because that's when the mail in voting window opens. That's when in most some- states. In, in, in many states, uh, absentee ballots are sta- are starting to get filled out then, early voting starts then, um, and it's still early enough that you can make hay about it for the following two weeks. Like a losing side can can call cyber foul, um, pointing at that thing for, you know, and just eat up, eat up news for, for the rest of October. Just uh, this is yeah, it, it's a bit personal, but it goes to one of the reasons that I'm not in the U.S. right now. Um, I, I think you know we we had the option to to be near family and and ride out the pandemic. Um, you know, part of the concern that was in the back of my mind was how how um, you know the potential for, for civil unrest and and those sorts of things um, are amplified by the backdrop of the pandemic and, and economic depression and a lot of other stuff. So I think the the number of things that are available for an actor to tweak on, and and the amount of leverage that's present, um, you know, it, as we do version two of this panel is is radically different to um, to what it was, you know, last last time we got together and spoke. So, you know, from from a, a mitigation standpoint, it really does come back, you know, for the for the typical audience of this. Uh, this panel in, in DEFCON is making sure that you're not adding to the problem. Um, you know, the, the, the whole idea of like polarization of just general distrust, like nihilism, all of that sort of stuff. And I do believe like we are talking, you know, Armageddon-ish type stuff at the moment, but I do believe fundamentally in like working back from the worst case scenario and then and optimizing the critical path from there. So it's an important conversation to have. Yeah, that's a good segue into the last question we're going to do today. Um, so, you know, obviously we talked about uh, mail-in voting as the the next best mitigation for forcing people to, to kind of show up in person and definitely a better alternative than I'd say any potential half-baked uh, e-voting solution at the last minute that would come in and swoop. But obviously with the rhetoric that's been, uh, you know, spoken by various folks in the press uh, from various levels of government and elsewhere about uh, the validity and trustability of the Postal Service as well as their own financial woes uh, imposed upon them by Congress and pre-funding and so forth and so on. Um, you know, it was just announced today that uh, they had worked out a deal with a massive uh, infusion slash loan from the US Treasury. I think it was like $15 billion which is a huge chunk of change, uh, does keep people from necessarily having to rush out and um, you know running for stamps. But obviously I have reports from some of the locals here in, in the DC area, specifically Baltimore, about um, potential fallout from uh, the recent uh, postmaster general coming in and saying, please delay first class mail. 
Um, obviously, that puts a downward pressure on delivery of, of mail-in voting, as well as you know returning that and, and making sure that everyone hits with the deadlines with the postmarks. So where we sit here is our last best effort to run a secure election as a postal service. It is in dire straits. It has potential leadership that is working antithetically against the the essentially constitutionally or um, you know state that the you know the postal service exists in. You know what are what are the last bits here that we can ensure that that is functioning for us to to go forward? Um, are there are there ways that uh, maybe we we move up early voting even sooner so that we kind of play into the logistics of uh, extended timelines? Uh, is it write your senators and make sure that you know mail is is delivered in a timely fashion, or uh, you know, some other aspect is it, you know, what, uh, with that, and especially, you know, as you mentioned earlier too, I think it was Todd talking about the, the expected timelines being a lot longer for us to hear uh, the outcomes. Uh, you know, uh, if we have this extended timeline, what's our expectations to actually, you know, hear what the outcomes are going to be given this? I mean, it'd be great if, uh, if states would extend their deadlines. Like I was shocked to see that Texas, uh, for, for all the hand wringing Texas has been doing about mail-in ballots and like trying to make that hard. Um, the fact that Texas then turned around and, uh, and extended uh, uh, early voting was, was a, a sweet surprise. Um, you know, I don't know, we, we do things randomly here in Texas. Some things are great, some things are not so much. Uh, but I guess that's, I guess that's just here local in Texas. Um, I don't know, like, I feel like uh, everyone should, should you know, mentally hug a, a postal worker today. They do a lot of really hard work. Um, a lot of people depend on them for a lot of things. Um, you know, they are, they are in fact constitutionally enshrined. It's an article one power of Congress to establish the post office. Uh, and and uh, the, the fact that it became a target uh, for, for disenfranchisement is, is just mind boggling to me. But um, I think that we can all agree that uh, the post office is is a, a kind of a, a wonderful Americanism, really. Like it was, it was a a, a largely uh, the the this notion of a, a single stamp that carries something across the country. Like that is I'm pretty sure in America. It might be an English thing. It might be a British thing. Um, but <laughs> uh, one or the other. Uh, it's it's pretty great. So. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, if you have the opportunity to vote absentee, absolutely do it. Um, you know, the absentee voting, you can get all nerdy about it and say like, well, technically you're violating like the secrecy of, 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 of the ballot um, by doing that because someone can watch you vote and direct you vote and see that you vote correctly and see that you put the thing in and mail it away. Like, but that's almost a, a like, that is so low on my list of problems. <laughs> when it comes to democracy is, is vote selling. Um, you know, if, if it turns out that's a big deal, great. Like, let's, let's go tackle that. But it is, it is not, that has not been a problem since like the 19th century, so. Yeah, um, I, I wanna say too, we've seen uh, the, the current administration, um, we've seen the current administration actively attack the postal service on social media. Um, and so I, you know, I would ask folks to understand that I, I don't think there was a long game there, but I don't think that it's going to be um, unreasonable to see more attacks on the Postal Service from the current administration. Um, the uh, unreliability, the conspiracies about deals with Amazon, and then how Jeff Bezos ties into Amazon, and then with the Clintons, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to unpack there. Um, but I would say, you know, at the end of the day, like the, these are feds, these folks are feds. They took the same oath to the constitution that other feds take. Um, they're there to just do their jobs every day. And uh, the idea that postal workers themselves would be tampering with mail-in ballots is just kind of ridiculous. And oh, it's completely insane. <laughs> it, it really is it's ridiculous. And and if there were one, it's a blip on the radar if the numbers are out there of folks voting, right? So um, so let's just keep it all in perspective. And to understand the importance of the Postal Service, uh, when I was younger, the DMV test had a question that said, if you get to a four-way stop 
and there's a fire truck, an ambulance, a police car, and a mail truck who has the right of way. And everyone assumed like the ambulance or the fire truck, but it was in fact the mail truck because they are protected under, you know, the, the guise of the federal government. Certainly the mail truck wouldn't go first, but they could. And also if you hit a mail truck, you get into a lot of trouble too, because you've damaged federal property. So, you know, you probably don't want to go out and, and take your angst out on vandalizing mail trucks or yeah, bothering postal workers. So I just, that know. is a hot tip. <laughs> I, I feel robbing like post, robbing post perfect. offices used to be a hanging hanging crime yeah well they've <laughs> also got that crime a day book that just came out uh from the twitter feed I, I would hope that there's a chapter in there about weird stuff like that so all right then uh last thoughts on uh what we see as our future here um uh what you'll be doing um what you hope others will be doing and then where do you hope we will be I can go and take this first. Um, so yeah, nothing I'm going to say here really is anything new, I would say, that I haven't said. Um, but yes, in terms of what I'm doing, what CIS is doing, we are going to be working through and after the election to support um, election offices at the state and local level to ensure that they have what they need from a security perspective. Um, and we're committed to doing that. Um, in terms of, I think, what's maybe more valuable is what people watching this, what steps they can take and what steps they can recommend others to take. And this goes back to the two points that you have to be patient and you have to expect that things may go wrong, but that doesn't necessarily mean there has been interference and that doesn't mean that the election is invalid. So be patient, do not assume that results will come out on election day, it may take some time, but have faith that election officials are doing their best to have an accurate result, that we have process in place that if interference does occur, we can identify it. And just yeah, ultimately the main, main thing is that the people of America need to have faith in their own elections and that can go away without any actual tampering occurring, without any interference. Just if the people do not believe that their result was valid, then the result is not valid. So I think to everyone watching this, just to understand that what you believe happened matters and just to understand their process in place, their committed election officials, the federal government is here to support that process. And yeah, let's hope that we have a smooth, a free and fair election in November. <laughs> um. Sure. So, I mean, I guess like to just kind of reiterate what, uh, you know, everyone else says, like, um, you know, the, the best defense against any election shenanigans is, is voting and voting in numbers that are too hard to, to push one way or the other. Um, if people go and they vote, um, especially people who have historically been disenfranchised or haven't felt the need to go vote, um, you know, it is you hear it every election, but this election is literally the most important election of your life so far. Um, and so go, go vote. And hopefully if enough people do that, um, you know, any kind of shenanigans will be, will be drowned out by the, by the overwhelming signal that we have. Um, me personally, I not only am I going to vote early, um, I'm very excited to do that. Um, but I'll be working the polls. Uh, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> It'll be November and there will be no vaccine. And so I will be doing a lot of cleaning and hoping uh, that uh, not too many polls close that day. Um, you know, there were poll closures. There were, uh, um, in our last election here in Texas, there weren't any poll closures like on the day of. Um, you know, people did show up. They got enough recruits to come and do the thing. Um, I did have a couple poll workers not come to my polling place, but we had enough people to pull it off um so hopefully that is that will will remain the case um you know but that's going to be november so who knows like what the what the pandemic will bring us um if it becomes impossible to vote in person uh in a in a in any kind of crowded way then you know we'll we'll just have to deal with that as it comes but um but if if you have the bandwidth and the health uh to to throw in for a what is a super fun, sounds boring, but it's actually pretty fun, like 14 hour day, uh, go, go work the polling place. I'll, I'll go next. Um, I, you know, I will say that I'm very much looking forward to returning 
to to the US and and this is honestly a part of that so again on on a you know speaking to the subject matter but speaking to it from a very personal standpoint it's like my adopted country is is trying to figure all of this stuff out and and I'm looking forward to being past it is is something that you know I'm it's heavy it's the heavy thing um so aside from that practically you know if you for, for the hackers um find out how people where people are asking for help uh go help them um like look for the stuff that people have already volunteered you know the volunteering stuff that we talked about at the start just to reiterate that some of that help might be it go looking for it see if you can find opportunities to provide your skills into those different areas um help out on the open source projects uh, and, and some of the other things that are going on that have been volunteered. So Arlo, we mentioned before, uh, verified voting and stuff on GitHub, go bang on the source code. And if it's legit, say so. Um, if there's a problem, submit a PR, help make it better. Uh, if there's, if these audits are a part of, of how we have a, a, a peaceful kind of acknowledgement of the count after the fact, then you'll have played a pretty big role in that, I think. And then finally, um, you know, don't don't scare your grandma between now and November. Uh, if you if you're doing security research and you find something, you know, talk to talk to Jack and the crew at CISA and Sir. Try to talk to the vendor. Just be very mindful of the fact that dropping any kind of anything that looks like a vulnerability on the internet right now is highly highly exploitable from actors from a disinformation standpoint, and you don't want to be a part of the problem. Technically, you have the last couple of days because. July sucked when it came to Vons, so or at least people had to clean up after Vons. So let's let's make August yeah, well, better. We can we can it's 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 DefCon month, so the internet's on fire this month anyway. But <laughs> maybe after that, I don't know. October, let let October be quiet then. That's cool. Uh, Kimber, any last? I <clears throat> it's unprecedented, so it, it's it's anyone's guess what actually happens on election day and and the months following, um, vote, just vote. <laughs> I tell your friends, tell your family, vote, vote safely, um, vote mail in if you can. Uh, if you pay attention, your state may have deadlines or your district on when you have to let them know that you're going to be voting by mail in ballot. Some folks, some folks, here didn't understand there was a two-part process to mail-in ballot. You had to request one to receive one. It, it didn't automatically get sent to you. Um, so just being aware of how your uh, local districts work when it comes to mail-in ballots um, so that you can participate. And if you have to go to the polls, you know, wear a mask, social distance. If you can and you don't have high-risk folks at home, volunteer at your local polling places and, and do what you can to make it safe for um, our most vulnerable populations to be able to get out and have their voices heard. Well, yeah, that's a great uh, thing to end on. Um, you know, obviously I have, a, I have a spouse who's immunocompromised. So, um, you know, I preemptively um, requested a, a mail-in mail -in ballot. I know some states require a extenuating uh, excuse in order to get a uh, absentee ballot. So, please check with your uh, local officials on what you can do to do that. Um, obviously, you know, a safe and secure voting is important, but uh, safe and secure also means uh, individuals as well. Uh, with that, I'll close out our panel. I do appreciate uh, Kimber, Jack, uh, Casey, and Todd for joining us this evening for the, the recording. Uh, again, this was the election security part two, the infrastructure strikes back. Uh, while I can't uh, necessarily drop in some John Williams here, uh, use your uh, mind's eye as well as the Starfield background to kind of get it through. And uh, hopefully uh, come November, we'll see what kind of shakes out. And uh, geez, maybe next February, we'll have a, a cleanup on this, maybe a part three. Uh, hopefully it doesn't end up with a bunch of Ewoks running around saying Ugnug. But anyhow, uh, once again, thank you very much. And thank you for your time. Take care. <laughs>